Well, hello, uh, Rabbi Block. Um, welcome to Sophia, uh, which is a, a program that I uh, host on uh, the Meaning of Life TV, uh, which is a part of the Blogging Heads TV network. Um, I'm Daniel uh, Kaufman. I'm a professor of philosophy at Missouri State University, and I'm very pleased to have with me Rabbi Barbara Block. Uh, Rabbi Block, would you like to uh, say a few things by way of introducing yourself? Thank you, Dan. Yes, I'm Rabbi Barbara Block. I am the rabbi of Temple Israel in Springfield, Missouri. I've been here now for a year and a half. I am a second career rabbi. I was ordained in 2010 from Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati. I served Congregation Beth Aaron in Billings, Montana for four years before arriving in Springfield. Um, and just for disclosure, not that we're not not that this is the sort of conversation where disclosures are necessary, but I should just say tell everyone that uh, I have a very close relationship with Rabbi Block. I chaired the committee that the hiring committee that hired her. Um, she taught my daughter her bat mitzvah. She is the she is the rabbi at the synagogue to which I belong, and I also serve on the synagogue's board of directors. So I couldn't be more uh, compromised with respect to my feelings about Rabbi Block, um, uh, which uh, which uh, which are are strong and very positive. But the nature of the conversation is not not the such that that will that that will be an issue. But I just wanted everyone to know that. Um, so. Rabbi, I wanted to have you on to talk about Judaism generally, uh, but more specifically about Reform Judaism, um, in large part because the, 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 the Meaning of Life TV audience is very interested in religion, um, but most of the programming has been either on Christianity or on, interestingly enough, Buddhism, in which there's a lot of interest uh, in the United States, and very little on Judaism, and I find that oftentimes people don't know very much about it. Um, and so this is going to be largely informational, uh, with you sort of sharing your knowledge and understanding, uh, of Judaism and of reform Judaism specifically. And so maybe what we'll do is I'll ask you some questions that'll sort of get us into these, into these issues. And then you can, um, you know, you can expand on them to whatever degree, uh, you like. Does that sound like a, like a good plan? That sounds great. Thank you. Okay. So first of all, um, right off the bat, I think that, it's difficult sometimes for people to understand Judaism because when they think of religion, they think of Christianity. And there, there are ways in which Judaism is very different from Christianity, and I don't, and I don't mean necessarily doctrinally. Um, but just in terms of what it means to say that someone's Jewish, to speak of Judaism. So maybe you could just talk a little bit on what Judaism is and what we mean when we say that someone is Jewish or what several sorts of things we might mean when we say that someone is Jewish. I'm going to start with being Jewish, and one is Jewish if one is born to Jewish parents, or if one joins the Jewish people through conversion. And there's more you can say about parent, which parent, and so on, but that's a simple answer. Um, and someone who is Jewish may or may not practice Judaism. Explain that a little bit. So there are people who are Jewish by birth. <clears throat> they recognize Jewish parentage. <laughs> Excuse me. They, but, so they are Jewish perhaps as an ethnicity. <clears throat> right. In right. the same way that uh, someone might identify, it's not exactly like being Irish, but it's being a part of a people because there is a Jewish people. So you can be a part of the people, but not practice the religion. But I have to say Judaism is more than a religion. That is, that's one meaning of Judaism. Judaism, of course, is a religion. But I'm going to explain a bit um, from the perspective of Mordecai Kaplan, a rabbi of the 20th century early 20th century in America, who said that Judaism is first and foremost a civilization and that the religion is a part of civilization, but it's not the whole thing. So Kaplan would identify that 
there Judaism is a culture that that culture includes foods and holidays so you might be Jewish and celebrate great Passover without be having uh, certain beliefs beliefs that we would identify with the religion uh, literature there's Jewish literature not just the ancient literature but there are Jewish authors, Saul Bellow, and uh, a wide range of Jewish authors that we might consider to be part of Jewish literature, Chaim Potok, favorite of mine. And there are Jewish arts. So there's, there's a whole culture there that is part of Judaism. And very importantly, there are Jewish values, among which I would identify welcoming the stranger, and hospitality, honesty, education is often mentioned as a strong Jewish value. And it's not that other people of other cultures might not also have those values, but these are communally considered to be important. And another value that is important is the value of community. There are some religions which are about individual salvation and about the individual. But Judaism has a very strong focus on community and the Jewish community. And I'll say in all religions you have, for instance, in Christianity, the church is the body of Christ. And in Buddhism, you have the Sangha. But I think the community in Judaism has a primacy that is, is very special to Judaism. Do you think that that's partly because there is this distinctive peoplehood sense of, of being Jewish in addition to, in other words, so, someone who's, someone who's, let's say an Irish Catholic, you know, they're, 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 they're going to belong to multiple communities in a sense. Um, um, because, and maybe, and maybe their Irishness gives them their sense of peoplehood, whereas their Catholicism, but for Judaism, it serves these multiple roles. And so maybe that's one of the reasons why the communal aspect do you think that might be? That is certainly a part of it, and the fact that for many years, uh, in many in many places we've lived, Jews have been more restricted at, to their own people. This is not so much the case now, but that's there, a good point. Yeah, Jews in most European countries for most of history were not citizens of their country. They were basically only part of the Jewish people. And I also want to say that there, when we speak of Jewish culture, there is not just one Jewish culture. Uh, some of the more well-known distinctions are Ashkenazic Jewish culture, which is uh, German and Eastern European. My heritage and the heritage of most Jews in the United States is Ashkenazic Jewish. That's what people in America tend to think of when they think of Jewish culture. Right. But there's a, another culture uh, called Sephardic, which came out of Spain and spread to Mediterranean lands, and also Mizrahi culture, the culture of the people who never left the Middle East. And then there, and the culture varies from place to place. And so I see at Christmas time, Christians talk about how People in this country celebrate Christmas and how people in this part of the world celebrate Christmas. And Jews, too, have different ways of celebrating and observing and different cultures, different music, depending on where they have lived. But our texts and our rituals tie us together. Okay. Um, so that's actually, that's, that's great. It's, it's very, very okay. thorough. And I think, I think people will... If they don't understand that, they're not going to understand it. Um, let's talk now a little bit about about Judaism in America, mm -hmm. um, where people may may be familiar with the fact that there seem to be in America various denominations of Judaism. Um, there's what's called obviously Orthodox Judaism. There's what's called Reform Judaism. Somewhere in between, there's what's called conservative Judaism that, that elsewhere is called majority Judaism. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about these, are these denominations like the denominations of, of the Protestant, uh, that we find in the Protestant church, or what, what do these denote, these different designations? 
one important point is that these are not different religions. That whether you are an Orthodox Jew, Reform Jew, Conservative Jew, uh, you are still a Jew. And unlike in Christianity, where if you move, say, from being an Episcopalian to a Catholic, you need to convert. Uh, you do not convert when you change from a, attending, participating as a conservative Jew to an Orthodox Jew or a Reformed Jew. We're all one religion. The Reformed terminology is that we are different movements or different streams. Orthodoxy doesn't like that. We haven't come to, a con to an agreement about the language that we would use. But I'm going to use the Reformed terminology that there are different movements within Judaism. And as you mentioned, these movements are American. My mother growing up in Vienna, Austria, had never heard of Orthodox and Reform, although there was... Um, there were different ways of, of observing. There were people who were more strict about things, people who were less strict about keeping rules, but there weren't these different movements. That said, Reform Judaism actually did start in Europe, in Germany uh, specifically. In the, it, it arose from for two reasons. One is that there was the Enlightenment in Europe, and uh, during the Enlightenment, Christians started to look at their Bible as an historical document, and Jews did as well. And the other, and I'll get back to that, but the other, um, the other development that influenced the beginning of Reform Judaism is that in the early 19th century, Jews began to have citizenship in the countries where they lived in Europe, starting in France and moving to Germany and then to other countries. Until then, Jews were granted an edict of tolerance. They were allowed to live in a land or expelled and then welcomed back, depending on the whims of the local leadership. They were subject to Jewish legal authority within the Jewish community. So the rabbis and the Jewish institutions had a great deal of power over people's lives. If they had a conflict with someone in the Christian community, then that would go to the uh, courts of the land. But internal matters were settled internally. And there was strong need for the Jewish authorities to exert control so that the people did not get in trouble with the local Christian authorities. So that started changing in 1800, and Jews were able at that time to pursue secular education. They had not been welcomed before that in the universities, so the education changed. Their social opportunities changed. They had much more social intercourse with the peoples about them. And there were some who thought that it would be better if, for instance, our worship services were more like German Protestant worship services. And so they changed the worship service uh, to be shorter and to, in various ways, resemble what their Christian neighbors were doing. So let me, let me just interrupt you for one second um, and ask you a question about this. Yeah. And, and I suspect the answer is going to be both, but I'm just curious. Um, to what extent would you say that the Reform Jewish movement is the result of the effects of the Enlightenment and modern thought on Judaism? Uh, and of course, one of the great Enlightenment philosophers uh, was Moses Mendelssohn, um, um, who, who was a Jew, um, and who actually, uh, I believe, Kant thought very highly of. Um, um, to what extent it was because of Enlightenment? And, 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 an, and an application of the sort of rationalistic, more rationalistic ways of thinking to religion. And how much of it was a result of the desire to assimilate more fully because this new opportunity to sort of live, to become citizens of these countries uh, had arisen? It, it was probably both, and it probably varied with the individual, and it changed over time. And reform started not as a capital R reform movement, but as a small R, Jews, and remember there weren't Orthodox Jews yet either. Right. It was just some Jews wanted 
to change some things. And I think it was all of the above. Moses Mendelssohn, whom you mentioned, was someone who wanted to be uh, a Jew in the home in the synagogue and a citizen on the street. That was his way of cutting it. He would still, by the way, be considered an Orthodox Jew right. by standard because right. he still followed uh, the traditional teachings of Judaism. So, and, and within Orthodoxy uh, today, there is a very wide spectrum. None of these movements or streams are monolithic. So, I, you asked about in America. So, in America, Jews have been here since the 1600s, and we, this was a very fertile ground for reform because we have always been citizens since 17. Uh, after the, not 1776, but once we formed a government in this country, we have always been citizens of the United States. And the United States celebrates individu individualism and autonomy and, and plurality of, of religion. And so when Germans came to this country in great numbers in the mid 19th century, they, they, they brought with them the reforms uh, that they had been developing in Germany. And America was a very hospitable place for these reforms. And the reform movement with capital R had not yet been established, but by that time there were definite uh, reform congregations. And in, re in response to the reforms, the Jews who did not think that reform was a good idea, named themselves Orthodox, which in a way is, is not a traditional Jewish idea, right, right. practice. But they, they reacted against the, the people who said, we don't have to do things the way we've always done them. And right. there hasn't, right. and in fact, history shows that there hasn't always been one way that things have been done. So the Orthodox Jews chose one of many Jewish legal codes, the Shulchan Aruch, and said, this is the right way. Right, okay. I also want to say, you know, I, I speak as a Reformed Jew, and at the same time, and I will, I will defend, uh, do apologetics for Reformed Judaism, I think that we have a lot right, but I don't think that any one movement has it all right. And I think that each of the movements has some have good things to contribute and that we can learn from each other. So I do want to say that. Yeah. Yeah. No. And, and I did not, um, you know, you are a reform rabbi and especially given how you came to the profession, to this career, you were very conscious of what you were doing. You were already highly educated before. And so you certainly believe in the, what reform reforms take on this because of the way you, you came to it. You know, you thought this through. You didn't you just it wasn't like you were born into something and then went straight to seminary. I mean, you really must have thought this through before you chose. Didn't you I, didn't you flirt with I, being a reconstructionist? I, I will I will give a bit of personal history here yeah. if I might. That I my parents, neither of them actually in some ways was a reform Jew uh, but they sent us to reform Jewish, they joined a reform temple. It was the closest to where they were at. Uh, and uh, so I had 11 years of reform Jewish religious school back in the 60s. With, and the it was quite a formal setting. Uh, and I then experienced uh Jewish life in college at a college where we had a small Jewish student group, no rabbi. We did things ourselves. And the conservative kids kind of took over and we prayed out of their prayer books. And so I became very familiar uh, and to some extent comfortable with the conservative prayer service. I, like many Jews and many others, wandered around in my 20s, uh, kind of a seeker. And had had fallen out of love with Reform Judaism. And when I became a founding member of a congregation in Minneapolis, St. Paul, in 1988, one of the big questions was affiliation with the movement. And we looked both at the Reform movement and the Reconstructionist movement. And of the two, 
I I leaned somewhat reconstructionist, although I thought in the end we were best affiliating with any movement. That was where I was at at that time. Right. In 2003, there was the big biennial of the Union for Reform Judaism in Minneapolis, and I attended and I heard the president, the rabbi who was president of the union, speak on Saturday morning at our big Shabbat service, and he outlined what he thought was important, and I thought he was right on on all his points, and that really moved me back in more into uh, reform frame of mind. And there are a number of reasons that I have, uh, in a way, come home to reform Judaism, but it is not the reform Judaism of my youth. Yeah, yeah, and we and since we haven't really, you know, we're going to talk in detail about the various elements of Reform Judaism, and so we probably shouldn't front load because people won't know what we're talking about. Um, 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 just one I thing. Will, go will, ahead. I, let me say, Reform is not Reform ED at the end. It's Reform because we we see re, Reform Judaism, Judaism, and our understanding as changing over time. So there's ongoing reform. It's not like we went in and we changed things. We got it right and we stopped. Right. We're not like the we're not like the Jewish version of Calvinists, right? Because yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's called reformed Christianity, right? Um, uh, one thing I just would mention, just so the viewers don't realize, um, the, the reconstructionism that you mentioned. You know, if we were to map out these denominations on a sort of a left-right uh, spectrum, then the reconstructionist is even more liberal progressive than the reform is it should be mentioned though that it was it was founded it was created by the mordecai kaplan who you mentioned right. um who i believe was was he not a rabbi was, at the jewish theological seminary so he was of the conservative movement and his um, aim was not to start a movement but to develop a philosophy that would inform all the movements which right, to some right. extent it has he's but, been very influential so yeah some yeah. of his followers decided they wanted their own institutions and uh, their own congregations, right. and right. so now there's reconstruction. All right, so let's talk about Reform Judaism, and I will I will say, you know, it is the largest denomination of Judaism or movement in the United States. It's I looked this up as of last year it was thirty five percent, with the others uh, taking up a much smaller share, and a significant chunk, about thirty percent, not identifying with any movement at all. And so, you know, this is mainstream Judaism in the United States. And so it's perfectly apropos to talk about um, and to get into. Um, um, and uh, odds are, if you know a Jewish person, you, you likely know a reform, uh, a reform Jew. So let me let's start off with um, um, the, the first thing I just wanted to ask is, you know, uh, one of the characteristics, it seems to me, of a lot of the, the modern, more liberal versions of these Western religions, whether it's the mainline Protestants or Jews, uh, Jews like Reformed Jews, um, because of the demographics that these uh, religions draw from, you're, you're likely to have people who are highly educated, who are professionals, and who pro whose, pro whose belief in the supernatural is probably not uh, the same sort that you would find in more traditional communities um, um, uh, what, what is the, A, what is the official reform view on God and the supernatural, but B, what has been your experience and what in your estimation, and obviously this is anecdotal, of what the average lay person in the, in the, in the congregation's views on this are? Okay, there is not one reform position about God, and also, within traditional Judaism, it's understood that although God does not change, unless you are a certain kind of mystic, God does not change, but our understanding of God changes. We see in the course of the stories of the Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, and a developing understanding about God. And in our liturgy, which goes way back, one of our prayer, one of the prayers developed by the rabbis starts out, blessed are you, Adonai, our God, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. And 
the ancient rabbis asked, why do we say God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, rather than God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? God's the same. And the answer is, this is traditional Judaism, that in each generation, we have a different relationship with God. Mm. Abraham's relationship with God was different from Isaac's, was different from Jacob's. So now moving into refor the Reformed Jewish conception of God, that too has changed over time. And we do not have a creed. The closest we, we're not a creedal religion. In order to belong to a congregation, you do not have to sign a statement of faith. We're considered more covenantal. Um, it's a matter of brief, a covenant between us as a people and God. So there's, the, the closest we have to a creedal statement in our service is the Shema. Hear, O Israel, Adonai is our God. Our God is one. Adonai is one. So we have the oneness of God. And then you can ask, well, what does that mean? And things that we would traditionally say don't fit. There's a lot that does fit. What doesn't fit in that oneness of God is that natural objects are not God. The sun is not God. Right. The moon is not God. God is not the entire universe. There's something else beyond that is God. The second thing that is important uh, because we're um, in relationship with Christian culture is that it is not a Jewish belief that God would ever be on earth incarnate as a human being. That is definitely outside what would be acceptable Jewish belief. So let me, before you could, before you go on, let me just ask you uh, just for, to refine some of this a little bit. Um, does reform Judaism accept the basic notion of the God of the attributes, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, omnibenevolent, and does do we do does it think of God roughly as a supernatural person, right? Or or are there more inchoate, vaguer? Um, I think there are there are more. You know, at some point, um, various points in history, those those concepts were debated. Um, the closest we have actually to a Jewish statement from the Torah about God. I have it here is from the book of Exodus and and God is portrayed in many many different ways in the Hebrew Bible but there's one point at which Moses really Moses wants to see God's face God says you can't see my face and live but I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and make and I will pronounce my name before you and what God says according to the Hebrew Bible about God is Adonai, Adonai, a God compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in kindness and faithfulness, extending kindness to the thousandth generation, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet, God does not remit all punishment, but visits the iniquity of parents upon children and children's children upon the third and fourth generation. It is overall a very positive view of God, but not, but but there are some consequences to bad behavior, but only to the third or fourth generation, which in in a way you can interpret naturalistically. If parents are do really bad things, the reality is their children suffer. Yeah. But but God is forgiving. God um, God visits the the good stuff you do lasts for a thousand generations. The bad stuff to the third or fourth. So it's a it's a very positive and loving image of God. Is it all powerful? Is it omnipotent? Is it omnibenevolent? Um, can argue about that. There's no statement of that theological statement yeah. that, of that kind um, in in our literature. I think we we are far more nuanced in what we say. Now, but that's what you just read. To, so that's biblical. Uh, right. But in terms of Reform Judaism as a modern, okay. liberalizing version of this ancient 
uh, religious tradition, do you, uh, is there a difference in the way that reform looks at God in keeping with its modern modernity or, or not? Okay. So there were, um, we don't have a creed and we don't have an authority as such, but we have a conference of rabbis, of which I'm a member, the Central Conference of American Rabbis, my rabbinical association. And from time to time, that association has met to come out with statements of principles. And beginning with the Pittsburgh platform uh, in the 1900s, which was a foundational document, I'm not going to read from that. Uh, that talked about a God idea. And I'm going to read you excerpts of what the three following, uh, two following statements said, and then the most recent statement. So the Columbus Platform of 1937 starts, about God, starts, the heart of Judaism and its chief contribution to religion is the doctrine of the one, the living God, who rules the world through law and love. Okay. So that's where we were in 1937 as as a movement. Now, individuals might think differently. Right, that's a that's separate question. I said. Yeah. That's what the rabbi said. The next time a statement, a platform was made was in 1976. So history had happened between yeah. 1977 and 1976. And the statement is very different about God. And this is an excerpt from the middle of the statement about God. The trials of our own time and the challenges of modern culture have made studied belief and clear understanding difficult for some. Mm. Nevertheless, we ground our lives personally and community, communally on God's reality and remain open to new experiences and conceptions of the divine. So open to new experiences. That's it, fascinating. It allows, yes, it allows for a variety and it acknowledges that not everybody is able to believe. That really leaves open a tremendous range of possible ways that an individual congregant may think about God. That's really fascinating. And it's worth saying just for the audience that the Reconstructionist movement explicitly disavowed supernaturalism. Um, uh, and Kaplan, as you said, rightly said Judaism is primarily a civilization. The reform never explicitly eschewed supernaturalism, but it sounds to me like they really sort of left things in such a way that it could accommodate almost any view of the nature of the God, of sort of the nature of the Godhead, um, With, beyond, within certain yeah. boundaries. Yes. Bound. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. That's, that's so I, really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought it would be to, to our listeners. And I want now to read the most recent, not plat, they didn't call it a platform, but the statement of principles of the CCAR, which was written, uh, and this is by a committee of rabbis in 1999. Okay. And by the way, all of these were written by committees of rabbis, and they were the view of the majority, not everybody necessarily agreed with everything. Right, right. Said. So here's what was said, and I'm going to read it in its entirety in 1999. We affirm the reality and oneness of God, even as we may differ in our understanding of the divine presence. We affirm that the Jewish people is bound to God by an eternal brief covenant as reflected in our varied understandings of creation, revelation, and redemption. We affirm that every human being is created in the image of God, and that therefore every human life is sacred. We regard with reverence all of God's creation and recognize our human responsibility for its preservation and protection. We encounter God's presence in moments of awe and wonder in acts of justice and compassion, in loving relationships, and in the experiences of everyday life. We respond to God daily through public and private prayer, through study, and through the performance of other meets vote, the sacred obligations, to God and to other human beings. We strive for, and, and re remember this is rabbis speaking, we would like 
choose all to do these things daily, whether or not everybody actually does. We strive for a faith that fortifies us through the vicissitudes of our lives, illness and healing, transgression and repentance, bereavement and consolation, despair and hope. We continue to have faith that in spite of the unspeakable evils committed against our people and the sufferings endured by others, the partnership of God and humanity will ultimately prevail. And this partnership between God and humans is a very important idea in modern day reform Judaism. And finally, we trust in the, our traditions promise that although God created us as finite beings, the spirit within us is eternal. And the summation line is in all these ways and more, God gives meaning and purpose to our lives. That also seems to leave a lot of space. Um, yes. Because one of the things that struck me as you were reading that is how many times they say that we encounter God in ways that are not the meeting of a person, right? I mean, right. I think in Christianity, there, especially Protestant Christianity, there's such an emphasis on the relationship with Jesus that the notion of what it is to encounter God is very much analogous to what it is to meet another person, except that the person is a supernatural person. And this, you encounter God in in the things you do in your life, and the sort of the in the in the roles that you play, and the the, and so that also seems to leave a lot of room for the individual congregant to sort of think of this in their own way within a certain broad uh, broad frame, which I is one of the things I find appealing about. I, mean, I should tell people. I mean, I'm if people ask me, I define myself as an atheist in the sense that I don't believe that anything there is anything supernatural. Yet I have no, you know, I'm very comfortable uh, saying also that I belong to my religious tradition because at least the, the version of it that, that we belong to seems to me at least to permit a pretty wide latitude of how we, of how we um, interact with and see our relationship to these things. Um, um, I hope I haven't admitted too much and you're not going to throw me off the board now for, for, for disclosing this, but... <laughs> Um, Dan, I knew this before you. I know. <laughs> um, that's that's really really interesting. Um, let's let's go ahead. You were going to say something. I, there's one more thing I want to say about this. In your daughter's class, the eighth grade in high school religious school class, um, I was I was told by their previous teacher that they had an interest in in God, the topic of God, and so I brought with me to the class. A, an exercise with 21 statements about God. And for each one, they could mark, yes, they agreed with it. No, they didn't agree with it, or that they were not sure. Hmm. And some of the questions are, um, I believe that God does not interfere in the affairs of people. I believe that God intended us never to understand certain things about the world. I believe that God rewards good. I believe that God listens to prayer. I believe that praying can benefit the person who prays, even if God doesn't listen. So there's a whole wide range of statements, 21 statements. There was not a single statement among the 21 that six students who responded to this all responded the same way. Hmm. So there was and no I, consensus on any of them. That's right. And so, you know, that class loves debate. So I set it up with some of them where there were about even numbers of yeses and nos to talk about it. And yeah. that's, you know, one of the meanings of Israel, we talk about the people of Israel as those who struggle with God. And I think one of the benefits to our communal religious life is talking together about these very difficult and deep issues. And I also did a similar exercise with the adults, and there was no consensus there either. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so we talked we talked quite a bit about the view of God and of the supernatural, and and let's now talk a little bit about the texts. Um, um, so, first of all, maybe you might just educate the viewers a little bit, just briefly, on what are the canonical texts in Judaism. Um, um, and, um, and then talk about what is the reform attitude towards these canonical texts. 
Okay, the first and most important of the canonical texts is, of course, the Hebrew Bible, comprised of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, uh, which you may know is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and followed by the books of the prophets, the historical or historiographical historiographical books, historiographical, <laughs> and, and then the final section of writings, which includes Psalms, Proverbs, and books including Esther and Job and Ecclesiastes and so on. So, and this is different from the, an order of a Christian Bible. Right. The order is different, and the exact books that are included are a bit different, but it's, it's similar. And we call it the Hebrew Bible. We do not call it the Old Testament because we don't consider it old. We don't think there's a new one. <laughs> so. Well, we recognize that for Christians there is a new one, but it is not our scripture. Right. It's not new for us, yeah. It's very important that you understand that Judaism did not stop when Christianity began. So while Christians were writing the New Testament, we were writing the Mishnah, which was compiled in the year 200, which reads more like a legal text. And by the time of the Mishnah, the, a lot of the culture had changed for the Jews. In the year 70, the temple was destroyed and the temple was the site, among other things, the temple was the site of the animal sacrifices, which were what peoples of the Middle East all over and the Mediterranean, that's how they communicated with God. If you read the ancient Greek literature, before the men went to war, they sacrificed bulls to Zeus. Right. So, and, and one of the ways of interpreting the sacrificial laws in Leviticus was to limit this as much as possible. You can only do it at the temple. You can only do certain animals and... And so it was in some ways seen as an attempt to limit this animal sacrifice. And by the time the temple was destroyed, the rabbis were already developing um, other ways of worship, of study, and of prayer. And the brilliance of the rabbis of the Mishnaic period was that they said, this is our new service. The word avodah, service, was initially applied to the sacrificial cult in the temple. And they took that same word and said, our avodah now, our service is a worship, the words. And today it, the, we have services in the morning and afternoon. Those correspond, and the words used in Hebrew correspond to the times of the sacrifices. Right. And then there's an evening sacrifice as well. So they pegged it to the old culture, but brought it into modernity. And those rabbis um, did not say, well, we're going to throw out these old books now, particularly Leviticus, because we can't do those things anymore. They said, no, these are still our rules. And this is how we're bringing the old ways into modern times, which, by the way, is how I see what I'm doing as a reform rabbi, bringing the received religion and the received texts into our modern times. Right. Because right. Judaism was never an unchanging thing. So the Mishnah was compiled and times continued to change, of course, because times do. And so rabbis kept writing and interpreting the Mishnah. And in the year about 500, between 500 and 600, the Talmud was redacted, was compiled. Um, and that isn't just one book. I could hold up one book and show you the Mishnah. The Talmud is 72 volumes, the Babylonian version, which is considered the most authoritative. There was a separate Talmud in Jerusalem, which overlapped a lot because the two communities spoke to each other, but had, had some things in it about sacrifices that were not in the Babylonian Talmud and left out a lot of what was in the Babylonian Talmud. So we have two. We have two Talmuds. Those are the books that um, apply for an Orthodox Jew universally to Jews. After that, there was more dispersal among different places, and there, although there was a big um, center of Jewish learning for so, some centuries later in Babylonia, it was no longer considered that there was one central religious authority or one central religious writing. So. 
rabbis wrote for their own communities and decided for their own communities. And so once you get past the, the Mishnah and the Gemara, um, the Talmud, um, mm-hmm. if we take, so we, we're saying in a sense, the Hebrew, the Hebrew Bible and the, the Talmud are the sort of the canonical texts of Judaism. And then right. later there were some very influential, uh, rabbinical thinkers like Maimonides right. and like Rashi. Um, mm-hmm. But these are not so much considered canonical texts. Am I correct not in that? In the same way. Maimonides had two major works, the Mishnah Torah, in which he compiled. He went through the Talmud, which is very much, thinking of the word, it's not linear. You start in the middle wherever you start, and the rabbis go from topic to topic. It's associational. Right. That's the word. So if you want to know about the rules for Shabbat, you have to know the entire Talmud because they talk about Shabbat in the tractate called Shabbat, but they also talk about it throughout. So Maimonides, uh, because of the sad state of Jewish learning, and not everybody knew the whole Talmud well enough to know what the rules were, went through with his amazing mind and came up with 14 books of the Mishnah Torah, the repetition of the Torah, and said, these are the, this is what you should do based on the Talmud. These are the rules without all the discussion because the right. Talmud has, has many layered discussion and says, well, this rabbi says this and this rabbi says that. And then the rabbis agreed to go this way. Um, Maimonides redacted it, but people objected to that because he didn't cite his sources and say where he was taking things from. So there were other, co- that was a code, considered a code, although it's not really a code, code of Jewish law. There were others written over time. I mentioned the Shulchan Aruch as well. Maimonides also write, wrote a more philosophical text called The Guide to the Perplexed, or For the Perplexed. So none of the, uh, the major difference between all those other writings and the writings up through the Talmud is that the traditional teaching is that God gave the Torah, the first five books, to Moses on Mount Sinai. And it's taken that the entire written scripture was given to Moses and written down. What the rabbis who wrote the Mishnah and the Talmud did was considered oral law based on that scripture. And there are two ways um, that are traditionally related. One is that God really told the whole thing to yeah. Moses and Moses didn't write it down. Moses told it to Joshua. Joshua told it to the elders, told it to the men of the great assembly. And so all the rabbis of the mission and Talmud were doing was repeating orally what Moses had right. passed right. along and then eventually got written down. And the, well, impetus, the impetus to write it down was because of the dispersal, right? The Jews had been dispersed in the land, and so, well, we better write this down, or these oral tradi- these oral knowledge is going to get lost. That's the, yeah. And the, but, but the other explanation, is, which seems a little more realistic, is, no, they didn't, God didn't give Moses all of this, and all of this wasn't repeated, It, but God gave Moses the rules for how to interpret, mm. and there are compilations of those rules. So if you read... Uh, Mishnah Talmud, it'll say, based on this piece of scripture, you get this, and they're following certain rules of interpretation. Right. If you study those as a modern scholar with a modern hat on, the, and you ask the question, is this exegesis of the text? Is, is the Mishnah simply the explication of what's already in the Torah, which is how the rabbis presented it? That was their authority. Or is this eisegesis? They're reading things in that they want to see. And it's pretty clear, if you're a modern reader, that it's eisegesis. The rabbis were creating a religion for their times and saying, here's the proof text. Right. Although, as you properly pointed out, Mm -hmm. um, there really is no choice but to do that, right? I mean, um, I mean, look... I'll just give a very simple example that people will, I think, understand immediately. You know, one of the things, one of the laws that you find in the in the Bible is, the, is to, that you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. Right. Um, and, you know, clearly this is meant so, to, to sort of ensure that, that, you know, 
people are not sort of you know slave driven in their lives. There's a sort of a consideration to the person, to the individual, and to the person's family, and to this this need for time that's spent not working. Um, but of course, what counts as work depends entirely on the circumstances, on the context. What counted as work in 500 BC, uh, BCE might not be any labor at all in 2015. And so it's really not possible to follow these rules unless what they mean is updated, right? Well, let me say that it says nothing in the Torah about what counts as work. That's right. Do not work at your occupations. And when I say that our religion, whether you're Orthodox, Reform, whatever, the Jewish religion is not the religion of the Bible, which was based on sacrifice. Now, there are commandments in the Bible that we still would include as parts of Judaism. You shall not murder. Yeah. Um, and, and there are lots of commandments that are a part of it. And you shall observe the Shabbat. You shall observe the Sabbath. That is part of our religion. But how we observe that was developed later by the rabbis. And what they did was they they were primarily an agricultural society. They said, if you go through the Torah, there are 39 activities that are listed as agricultural work. Right. And so all the traditional restrictions are based on those. And what what happened, so that is, and, and for an Orthodox Jew, those come from God. Right. Because the traditional view is that God told Moses, told the, uh, right. told the rabbis, right. and so right. they were right. just... So these are, this is what God wants. Right. For a reformed Jew who sees this all from a more modern historical perspective, this was the development of the religion of the times, but we don't have to be bound to it. And when I was growing up in the 60s in the reform, reform congregation, uh, in what is now called classical reform, I was told that the essence of Judaism, not of Reformed Judaism, but the essence of Judaism is ethical monotheism. And that the ritual was secondary. And right. the ritual right. is what comes out of the halakha. So philosophers have, have since abandoned the idea of essences and essentialism, and so have Reformed Jews. And Reformed Judaism, though, has moved back to embracing more of the traditions and we recognize that without those traditions, it's hard to say what Judaism even is. For instance, I don't know too many Reform Jews who don't light Hanukkah candles. And they light one candle the first night and two candles the second night and three candles the third night. That is from traditional Jewish law, right. That is, right. which is called halakha. We don't think that God told us to do that, even if it's written in the, in the Talmud. But that's what we recognize as Judaism. If you throw all that away, what do you have? And even at the most classical reform um, periods, when ritual was actively shunned, still what we did was based in that tradition. Right. Our right. worship service, even when we prayed in English, the tr followed some traditional rubrics, and we would light candles. We wouldn't light them at the right time, according to orthodoxy, but we lit two candles, because that's what Jews do, and that was right. coming right. from the halakha. Yeah, and look, I mean, I remember, I'm old enough to remember when reform was much more reform in the sense of I can remember back in the 70s when if you went into a reform synagogue, no one was wearing a talit. Right. Um, no one was wearing a kippah, a, a skull cap. Um, maybe the rabbi was. And if the rabbi had a talit, it looked like it was like this wide. And it was like a little, it almost looked like uh, something a priest would wear. <laughs> I don't happen to have one, but they, they, if you're moving around on the in front of the congregation, those actually are much more practical. Yeah. Um, 
And now if you go to a reform, a reform service, you'll see you know, plenty of people wearing tallits. Most of the men wearing kippah, uh, the, some of the women as well. Um, and it's much more, it looks much more now like what a conservative service looked like in back in the 70s right. than, than, than a reform one does. And I guess part of the danger of that going so far that way is if you get rid of all the practices and the rituals, then all that's left is belief, and you wind up being almost forced in a creedal direction, um, which is not something you want to do, right? Um, and I also think that, that there is a sentimental connection uh, to the to the to the holidays and the traditions. And I mean sentimental in a good sense, not in a bad sense. That um, that connects people. Certainly, if it would have had no appeal, to, the, the the reform services of the sixties and would have no appeal to me at all. Um, precisely because they don't connect me in that sentimental way to tradition, history, people, and so on and so forth. Um, let me just ask you, while we're talking about the, the Bible for a minute and how Reform Judaism thinks of it, um, what about the question of historicity? Um, what is the Reform view? You know, you said, well, well, Moses didn't, we probably didn't get this, the, didn't get the whole thing from God, but he got some of it from God, um, you know, was there actually a Moses at all? I mean, well, you know, we now know pretty much from scholarship that there was no exodus from Egypt, that that's a myth. Um, well, the um, scholarship that's more in question. Well, but you know what I'm saying? What I'm saying is uh -huh. there's all sorts of scholarship that's going to come out that's going to show that various things that are in this text didn't happen or happened very differently or that right. the... Yeah. My question is, what is the reform view with respect to the historicity of what's in the Hebrew Bible. Okay, um, you have to take it part by part. First 11 chapters, the story of creation and the flood and so on, but we're pretty sure there was a flood. There's evidence of that because it's in the literature of many different ancient peoples. But those are at the level of mythological stories. They're very important. They teach us important things, but we don't take those as historical. Beginning with Abraham and Abraham's family, some of that may have happened in some way, but it still does not have the historical backing that we say it all happened the way this was written here. Exodus, actually, there is some evidence. There were peoples in Egypt who came and were enslaved and left, and it might have been one of those peoples. Um, we're never, I don't think we'll ever find the evidence to say, oh yes, this happened exactly this way. And, and even if there was a people who was in Egypt and enslaved and left and formed the people of Israel, uh, it's not likely that the details are all there. And I don't think that's particularly important because it's important how we learn from that. And there are, there are places where, in fact, there are seeming contradictions in the text to a modern mind. Uh, in the ancient mind, for storytelling, it doesn't matter that at one place it says Noah was told to say, take seven pairs and then was told to take two pairs. It was different, probably different versions of the story that were melded together. And it was richer if you had more different versions. Yeah. They didn't so, have the same. They didn't have the same conception of history in the ancient world as we do. Right, I'm just right. wondering about whether reform has an official position on the his, these these matters of whether, of the historicity of the text and 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 of the stories therein. What what we're taught is you know we're open to whatever whatever scholars find. Now, when you get into the books of the historiographical, the books of, that are historiographical, there are bases, you know, we know there was the kingdom of Israel uh, and that there were various dispersals and, and by the way, um, but they, they were written with the theological bent and for instance, the northern kingdom is always doing the wrong thing. Their leaders are always bad. The southern kingdom is always good. Guess which survived to write the history? The southern kingdom, right? <laughs> okay. So we can put two and two together, but with, you know, the we can be pretty sure there was a northern kingdom, there was a southern kingdom, that much of what we read there has a basis in truth, but is told from a point of view for a reason. Right. Um, so, so, so I guess what I'm asking is, so mm -hmm. 
Reform Judaism is comfortable with modern science and so and so and geology and stuff, and so it's not going to insist upon six days special creation, right? Well, um, and I, right. I think I can safely say that Reform Judaism rejects right. um, that kind of right. literal. Theory. The question is whether, in addition, mm -hmm. do, does Reform Judaism accept, accept whatever? the consensus view of modern scholarship is in history. It does in science, but does it also with respect to history? Uh, you know, in other words, if, if let's, let's uh, hypothesize, if it turns out that there's overwhelming consensus, the exodus didn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. Does the reform movement accept that sort of a judgment from secular scholarship or are there limits to what it will accept? No, it would accept that. Okay. It would, and it, there is no it. There well, is the, 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 but, the, the, but we, you know the the, the rabbinical there, assembly or whatever they call it. There, um, there are three there are three institutions in Reform Judaism. I mentioned the Union for Reform Judaism. That is actually a union of congregations. So our congregation Temple Israel belongs to that union. There is the Central Conference of American Rabbis. We come out with statements and position papers and so on. And then there's the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, which is our seminary where our scholars reside, and they don't all agree with each other, by the right. way. There, there's the question of um, the documentary hypothesis, which is very popular, uh, that you can separate out the first five books of the Bible and say these are J and these right. are E and P and D. And the first class I had in Cincinnati, 8 o'clock Monday, Wednesday morning, was taught by Dr. David Aaron a biblical scholar who told us that he believed that you could not, there was not good support for documentary hypothesis. He made a very convincing case and I drew in my notebook uh, the words documentary hypothesis, put a circle and a slash through it. So, no documentary hypothesis. We have a five minute break and our next course was um, the biblical history taught by Dr. Michael Cook who came in and spoke about the documentary hypothesis. <laughs> there isn't one you, even among these scholars who are teaching at the same institution, any more than all of you in your philosophy department would have agreement. But there, but there is agreement between Dr. Cook and Dr. Aaron that these um, these texts were written by humans over a period of time. Dr. Aaron's point is that you can't separate them into these four. You right. can't go right. verse by verse and separate them into these four. So. And there, there would be consensus among these scholars on, on the point you bring up. Is there not a governing body, though, that make, makes decisions with respect to – like, for example, so I, I have some association with the conservative movement. I used to work at the Jewish Theological Seminary. And when things like – issues would come up like, can we, or, can we ordain women? Right. Or can we marry gay and lesbian uh, couples? Right. Um, at least in the conservative movement, there is a governing body that makes these decisions. Um, is there a governing body in the in the in the reform movement that makes these decisions, or are these left to individual congregations? Um, they are. There is not quite the structure that there is in the conservative movement, um, but what we have is a group of rabbis, and I'm actually part of that group, we meet um, electronically uh, to consider uh, positions that would advise, they are advisory to rabbis. And this is in a long history, you know, I, I mentioned the Talmud and I mentioned the codes, the largest body of Jewish liter legal literature is neither of those. It is the responsa literature in which a community or a rabbi from one community will ask a more authoritative rabbi what to do in a particular case because there are always new things coming up. Right. And in the reform movement, and, and in some places this is done by a single rabbi. There, there are different um, rabbis who will issue opinions and depending on what a community thinks of them, they'll follow this rabbi or that. In Reform Judaism, we have a committee, the Responsa Committee, chaired by Dr. Mike, Mark Wachowski. And 
a rabbi, any rabbi, reform rabbi can send a question to Dr. Wachowski, often medical ethics issues, because mm -hmm. that, that field is ever changing, and sometimes practical issues or community issues. And uh, Mark will send out to us the question and any of uh, the traditional sources that would apply, um, Talmudic or otherwise, and we'll have a discussion. I mostly listen because I'm listening to some of the greater minds in my movement. But um, every once in a while, I have something to add. And the question that just came out uh, this week was on Tahara. There is a practice in Jewish burial that you wash the body according to certain um, rituals and dress it. And that's and, and Jewish uh Halakha says the way to dispose of the body is through burial in the ground. Mm -hmm. um, more Jews have been choosing cremation against the tradition, but Jews do choose cremation. And most uh, reform rabbis, and I believe some conservative, will officiate at the burial of cremains. So the question came up, can you do tahara for someone who's being cremated? And I had something to add that I have actually participated in Tahara for uh, the body of a woman who was then cremated. She was very poor. It was a small community, not my community in Montana. The community didn't see a way to come up with the money for the burial. The family was pretty much destitute. And so cremation was really the only option. It wasn't even that she had chosen it, but it was all that was available but we thought that, and there was discussion in the community, and it was decided that um, we would honor the tradition, uh, traditional practices as much as possible and do the tahara in preparation for the cremation. So, you know, things come up all the time. Um, but there's not, it's not as if, there's not a governing body that then after they decide, I mean, could, our, our congregation marries gays and lesbians, right? Right, right. Can a congregation in Mississippi say we're not marrying gays and lesbians because it says in the Bible that this is an, you know, in other words, is there any governing authority that sort of imposes? Uh, well, in addition to the, um, the response committee, which did have a position on, we recognize gay and lesbian marriages. Some, there are also resolutions of the CCAR as a whole. And it was resolved some time ago that rabbis were permitted to officiate and allow, and the same with intermarriage between Jews and non-Jews. It was left to rabbinic discretion. So there's and diversity the of practice. Is, there's a variety of practice, but the consensus is moving towards pretty much everyone I know in the reform movement will officiate at the wedding of gays and lesbians. Not every rabbi will officiate at an intermarriage. That in some ways is a more difficult question yeah, for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, that's, that's, the, the, yeah, I, and, and the reason the reason it's more difficult for us is because we know that intermarriage plays an enormous role in the, in a sense, reducing of the of the Jewish of the shrinking of the Jewish population because the the data shows us that those who intermarry are much less likely to, that, that the generations that follow of those families are much less likely to be Jewish, and so there's a real concern. Um, uh, uh, as to what to do about this, whereas with gays and lesbians, there isn't that concern, right? Um, well, for rabbis, um, right. For rabbis, there are, there's a variety. That's one concern, which some people would put more emphasis on than others. Um, there are a variety of reasons why, why rabbis, reform rabbis do and don't choose to officiate at intermarriages. And it's, and, and part of, part of the deal is we don't have, you know, we don't have a pope. Catholic Church has a pope who issues uh, edicts and pretty much, it, although there's Catholic Church is not monolithic either, right. but it, the expectation is that these rules are going to be followed. Whereas we have um, discussions and my authority as a rabbi is based in my education, my knowledge of Jewish texts and traditions and in the selection of me as the rabbi of the congregation. That's where the, the authority is based in, but it's really the authority to persuade. I also cannot tell my community, 
you have to do thus right. and such. Right. You don't have the. You don't even have the authority over your community that a, that a parish priest has over over his, um, uh, probably in terms of of what you can directly tell people to do. Um, right. Although um, I I do have freedom of the pulpit, so I get to say um, what I what I feel is the right message. But I I. I, I take into account when I'm thinking about what message to give, where people are at and what they can hear at a given time, right. which is actually what the rabbis of the Talmud said as well. You know, you shouldn't make the rabbis of the Talmud said you should not make a rule which the people cannot follow. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's yeah. Um, so we're, we're, we're just at an hour and 10 minutes. And so we probably don't want to push on too much longer um, I did have one last thing I wanted to ask you, um, and it's, it's it, you're a very good person to ask this question. I, um, we didn't go into all of Rabbi Block's uh, 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 biography, but one of the notable things about her um, is that she has a master's degree in philosophy, um, and uh, so, so had a brief flirtation with uh, with an academic career. Um, and this, so this question is particularly, I think you're particularly well suited to answer this. And the, the question is this, um, so within, so within the framework of reform, we've dropped really to a great extent, the idea of sort of divine sanction, right? That it's, the, that the, the, the reason why we do these, why we follow the laws, the reason why we go to services, the reason why we do all these things is because God commands it and God must be obeyed. We've sort of this has loosened up a lot from your own description. Even, even what we think of God as is given tremendous latitude. So the question I then have is this. Um, in that framework, what real reason is there to belong to the, to, 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 to be a part of the Jewish uh, community? Um, get, I can read moral philosophy and I can decide what, what, moral point of view, what moral framework best fits my conscience, and I can lead an ethical life by following, uh, the, by following a chosen moral philosophy. I could read John Stuart Mill, I can read Immanuel Kant, I could read Aristotle. Um, I can live an ethical, productive, good life without any of this. Um, so without, in the absence of that divine sanction, what do you see as the primary reasons for affiliation for belonging to the to the to the Jewish uh, community well you know you could also just read Jewish philosophy you know there's Kant and there's Mill coming from one tradition you could read Maimonides you yeah. could read you could read um, Heschel you could read any of a number of Jewish philosophers and reading philosophy and thinking about it as you know does not necessarily lead to ethical action. If you can just do it all in your head, that's uh, pretty impressive. But for almost all of us, if not all of us, just understanding ideas doesn't get us there. And you know, you can read mm. you can read a page, but I know also in the philosophical community, the idea that I'm I'm aware of is that you you reach truth in part by testing it out within a community of people who are reading the same things you are and trying to reach a consensus about what's right and that in the best case in a jewish community is what we should be about is reading our thinkers and um engaging with our tradition and um and then using that as a spur to a good life and the the rituals that we have have developed over many centuries, I think, really contribute to living a good life and to teaching values that I think are important. And How so? Give me some examples. Passover Seder, yes, I'm coming to that. Yeah. Passover Seder is most Jews attend, even if they've really walked away from the religion for the most part. And in the Passover Seder, we're instructed to see ourselves as having made that journey from being slaves in Egypt to freedom. And we reenact that. That's what the Passover Seder does. We don't, we tell a story, but through telling the story and um, doing the rituals, we reenact being slaves in Egypt and then being redeemed and brought into freedom. And 
by doing that, we, um, I think we internalize those values in a way that simply reading them is never going yes. to do. No. And in, in the community and in the discussion and in the discussion of what does it mean for us this year. And the texts, there are lots of ways to study the texts and lots of ways to learn from them. Um, this past Shabbat, the portion was the first seven plagues. Oh, and wow. the, I, we read about the first plague, the plague of blood, the Nile turns to blood. And what does Pharaoh do? Pharaoh turns and goes into his house. What do the people do? The people dig around for water, okay? Why is that plague happening? It's because there's something wrong in the society with the enslavement of the Israelites. And by the way, in the first chapter, which we read the previous week, it's very clear that it's not just Pharaoh. A leader cannot enslave a people without <coughs> others in, in the society cooperating. Right, right. So you've got a people who are, be, so it's not just innocent people who suffer in the plagues. These people are involved, it's very clear, in being oppressors. And so the plagues are a wake-up call. And what do they do? And they're inconvenienced, to use a word from Black Lives Matter. The people who don't have, have water in the Nile are inconvenienced. They have to dig around right. uh, for water. So that was the situation then in the plagues then. The lesson I take for it from today is if there are plagues, if we are being inconvenienced, if we're having problems with our climate, with more tornadoes and and natural events, you can choose any of a number of things which seem to be plagues today. Well, how are we going to respond to being inconvenienced and to having these plagues, plague of gun violence? You could right. choose that one. Right. Are we going to go into our own houses, look after our own interests, or ask, why is this happening? How do we as a society need to respond? Right. Right. So these stories are stories. and. They're very rich, and we'll see different things in them from year to year. And story has a power sometimes that rules that philosophy doesn't necessarily have, that um, even the commandments don't have, although the commandments are a good thing to hold on to, too, um, because they're there because we have lots of temptations. And just the commandments and even the stories, all of that together does not guarantee that right. Every individual is going to lead a good life. Right. No, but, I, I actually, I like what you're saying. I mean, it sounds to me what you're saying is, you know, and this is true both in religion and in outside of religion, is that belief in a series of propositions is not enough. That right. one has to participate in ethical culture, right? Um, um, and, that, and that what a religion like Judaism does is it provides an entire sort of form of life to operate in. Um, as opposed to uh, simply a list of propositions. Uh, uh, and, and that's why sort of the, the rule-following view even of religion is mistaken, right? Right. Be because it tries to reduce it all to a list of propositions um, um, without the realization that well, these need to be lived. And when you live them, you realize the complexity of all of them, right? Which is why we need all of this exegetical literature and interpretive literature because uh, uh, there isn't a list. There isn't a list of propositions that we can just... And, and, and live good lives. I mean, it sounds to me like what you're saying. Right. And if you want to know what our goals are, because, um, you know, Kant is, is so global, live in, you know, there, there's the golden rule. Golden right. rule is good to a point. Um, and we, of course, have Leviticus 19, love your neighbor as yourself. But we also need specific instruction. And there's certain things we repeat over and over again in our liturgy and our reading. Um, when we we talk about God, we thank God in the morning in the morning blessings for freeing the captive. What that says is freeing the captive is a good thing. We need to do it. That's where the partnership with God comes in. So one way to see some of the prayers is. They're telling us what it is to lead a good life, not in some very 
um, high level philosophical ways because you can get lost. You can spend your life gazing upon the beauty of the, <laughs> of, the of, of the rules. But these are, these are what we should do. And Judaism, by the way, says you're supposed to pray three times a day. You're supposed to pray, but it's also limited. You're not supposed to spend your entire day in prayer. You're supposed to pray, get your feet on the ground through doing that, and then go out and do. Yeah, yeah. So um, this is this is really great. We're, we're at about an hour and 20 minutes, and that's about the limit of what we can expect the audience to uh, yes. to pay attention to. Um, I want to I want to thank you very much for for uh, doing this with me uh, and and walking us through some pretty uh, complicated and some pretty deep uh, questions and um, I really I really appreciate this very much thank you thank you I I very much enjoyed it we have time for one last one last thing go ahead you why don't you close okay. us you close us out so, so yesterday I saw a question on someone's blog. If there were 100 people visiting the Louvre, the museum in Paris, and you had to make a choice, this is a good philosophical thing, you had to make a choice between saving those 100 lives or saving all the life contained in the Louvre, which would you save? You mean all the art in the Louvre? Yeah, right. But in order to save all the art in the Louvre, you'd have to kill 100 people. And I'm the wrong person to ask this. Okay. So, <laughs> Only because I teach aesthetics. <laughs> I know you teach aesthetics. But um, aside from maybe an, a, a stray aesthetics teacher, <laughs> it's hard for me to imagine a Jew saying, save the art. Mm -hmm. Talmud teaches the one who saves a single life is the one who has saved the entire world. And on this, on this blog, I was shocked at how many people said save the art that save the art and had all sorts of reasons for it. You can do good philosophical reasons for all kinds of things. But I, I bring that up in part because sometimes it seems like we're all reaching kind of an even ground and it doesn't matter which religion you follow because they all teach kind of the same thing. And I would say yes and no, not altogether. There are some places in which Judaism gives a very clear answer that I appreciate. As much as the rabbis engage in, in debate over, over the finer points of how, you know, cases and what the best way is to be, there are, there are some values that shine through that I think are, um, are worthy. Well, I think that's a very good okay. note to end on then. So, uh, uh, I look forward, maybe we'll do this again on another topic, uh, and I will certainly see you around uh, the synagogue. And very good. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. All right, take care, Rabbi. You too. Bye bye. bye, -bye.